Welcome to the My Tennis Coaching Podcast, your go-to resource for all things tennis coaching. Your host is Steve Whelan. Here, we dive deep into ecological dynamics and constraint-led coaching practices. Whether you're a seasoned coach or just starting out, this podcast is designed to build your confidence, expand your knowledge, and refine your techniques. Join me as we challenge traditional methods, explore player center approaches, and transform your coaching experience. Let's take your coaching game to the next level together. Stay tuned for insightful discussions and practical tips that will make a real difference on and off the court. And welcome back to the My Tennis Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Whelan. I hope we're well. And today I want to discuss somewhat a personal and quite challenging uh, situation that I've currently gone through uh, with a player. Recently, I had the experience of one of my players leaving and going off to another coach. And if you followed the podcast or the video blog over on YouTube, you know that over the past couple of weeks, I've released quite a few videos on my player questioning who they trust, who they listen to, me or they listen to another coach. And obviously last week's video on me being labeled as a, I just play games coach and people don't fully understand the ecological dynamics or constraint led coaching because it doesn't look like what traditional coaching looks like. So I want to discuss the player moving on today. And it's always sad when players move on. I always think, or always believe that I want players to move on and do the best and hopefully things work out for the player. But I want to talk about this, the sort of situation in and around the player. So the player, it was pretty good, pretty talented, played at a decent level, attended regional training camps from the national governing body, played at the highest grades possible tournaments at orange, played at a high grade at green. And the player's aspirations were for September to be selected by the national governing body as part of their regional development program to go and train at a regional performance center. That was their aspirations. And back in February, the player attended a national governing body camp, a regional camp, which is all the best players of the age group go together with a national coach spend the whole day there, and then the national coach gives the players and parents some feedback on where they are. After the camp in Feb, the parents sent me a message saying that the player needs to develop the serve and needs to develop their backhand. And that was the feedback from the national coach. My initial response was, okay, what information have you been given? And it was a case of, it was just a verbal communication of the backhand grip needs to change and the service action isn't fluid enough with the throwing action and the grip as well on, on, on the serve needs tweaking. So what I presented to the parents was, well, let's look at the data. Let's look at the stats. Like first serve, second serve percentage, pretty good in and around the average. Wins the vast majority of points when serving doesn't really make a huge amount of errors on the backhand. And the backhand, we've been training the player to basically set up the forehand. They're not trying to do too much with the backhand. It's just, it's a protection because the player's got a really good forehand. So we're going to try and use the backhand to get the ball back onto the forehand as much as we can. Again, the stats that I've got from lessons, because I film a lot of his lessons, stats don't really show that there's any weakness there. And then when I got given the camp report, player scored red, which is an area of immediate concern on serve. But I look at the stats and the, and the stats don't back that up. Like he, the, the, the player doesn't struggle to get the serve in. The player doesn't struggle to win points when serving. Okay. It doesn't look what the national coach would consider to be a model-based serve. And I explained my approach, the ecological dynamics approach, where I don't use a model-based system. I allow the player to work their own way out uh, in terms of movement solutions. And we use constraints to find a natural movement solution. And that's not to say we don't work on technique. Obviously, movement is technique. So 
So we need to make sure that the player is efficient and effective in the movement. But it might not look, and to be fair, the player's serve doesn't look like a typical tennis serve. It's like a bowling action. It's a bowling action, but it works. In a couple of years' time, he's going to hit maturity. He's going to go through growth spurts. His body's going to change. We don't know what's going to happen in a couple of years' time. And we may try and force this movement model on him. And then it may completely have to change. Like at the moment, it's working. So let's just focus on being the best at what we have today. And every week, we just continue to try and make adaptions to as the player grows. Like we don't need to have this model based serve. And to be fair with the parents, they bought into it and they said, fine, we trust you. We understand that kind of makes sense. And I did explain a bit about model-based coaching and traditional tennis coaching and the drawbacks to that as well and they said oh, okay that that makes sense but you could tell they weren't too happy but i took the feedback on board and over between february and may we worked on the serve we worked on the back end didn't explicitly go through it we developed it through games we developed it through constraints and we made great progress and again, if you want to look at technique, has technique changed? Has technique improved? We become more efficient, become more effective with the stuff that we were doing. The issue is, you, again, we touched upon this in the podcast last week, but you don't see it really. You don't see me telling him. You don't see him being quite explicit with it. He's learning through the game. And because it's not front and center, sometimes, again, if you're not a trained coach, you miss it. And then the player goes to a camp a few weeks back and the player misses out on regional training. He's not selected by a national governing body. He won't go to a regional training centre as part of the LTA's players list, which is disappointing. And I said to the parents a few weeks back as well, it's not the be all and end all. Just because you get on that list doesn't mean you're going to make it. Just because you don't go on that list doesn't mean you're not going to make it. It's just a list of players who the LTA believe, or the national government body believe, need support. And they're willing to support them with funding or coaching, whatever it may be. But it's not to be a lender. We don't know at the age of 10, 11, if these players are going to be professionals or not. We have no idea. The national government body, for all their experience and wisdom, they have no idea. Again, we don't know how these players are going to adapt. But the LTA make a decision, or the national government body in this case, they make a decision based on what they see, rightly or wrongly. I don't believe it's right that we are judging players here at the age of 11, whether or not they are talented or they're good enough to go to these type of centres, but that's not my job. But it really opens up a couple of questions here for me on reflection. Why... As a national governing body, are we looking at technique as a competency in terms of selection? Would Medvedev, TFO, would they make it through that system? Would they be deemed not technically good enough to go on their pathway? Probably not. World number one, top 10 in the world, Grand Slam finalist. Technically not what you would say model based you probably definitely wouldn't teach anyone to play like medvedev and you probably wouldn't encourage players to be like tiafo world-class tennis players when they get older it won't work which is a fair point we don't know how that player is going to mature and grow as the player matures and grows and changes physically their movement will change and I say this to coaches all the time, we can't teach an eight-year-old today things that we want them to do when they're 18 because there's so much change going to happen between eight and 18, physically, mentally. And this whole notion of we put these building, box, building blocks in place that the player has later on is absolute nonsense. It's nonsense because the player is going to change and adapt. You only have to look at Djokovic's forehand, Djokovic's serve. Look how much that's changed over the last 10 years as a professional. But then also from the national coach's point of view, I've got no issue with the national coach. I quite like the national coach that I'm talking about. 
got a lot of respect for the national coach. Done a lot of good things. Worked with some really good players as well. At the end of the day, it's their opinion. Now, I don't know if they've got some kind of framework or criteria. I know they used to. When I used to do talent camps, would have a framework and give players a score. So I don't know what framework they now have. I'm not involved in that side of things. But I'm guaranteeing it is a framework and the player will get a score based on these competencies. But then you also have to take into consideration the camp. It's a one day. What happens if the player is tired? What happens if the player is fatigued? What happens if the player is extremely nervous? But you watch Wimbledon in a couple of weeks and players have good days, players have bad days. Even at the biggest stage of a player's career, they can have a bad day. The movement pattern technique changes based on their self-state. They will move in different ways based on their emotional state. So how can you use a single day camp to justify that? And of course, it's over a period of time. These camps have them every quarter. So it's not just a one-off selection. It's over a period of time. I'm sure they take in consideration the different camps over time as well and see the progress. With a snapshot in time, in two years' time, when the player hits maturity and he potentially grows a couple of feet and packs on a load of muscle, some of the players I've been selected may not grow, they may not change, and therefore they're going to be off the level in a few years. But again, we don't have a crystal ball. It's absolute guesswork. And it goes back to a podcast I did a long time ago and we talked about the player pathway. We're focusing on the top 10% and we're neglecting the 90%. And these type of decisions have a ripple effect through tennis, which you're seeing here. Because based on the feedback from the coach, the national coach, based on the fact that the player hasn't been selected, it falls on me and I'm the one who gets made to suffer. So I lose the player then suffers because they lose that connection with me. And again, I don't blame the parents because they're trying to do what's in their best interests of the player. And if the national coach is saying they need to make these changes, and then they have the individual coach, me in this case, saying you don't need to make those changes. Are you going to believe national coach for the national governing body or just the tennis coach? The national governing body coach could say the sky is red and the players, the parents are going to believe it because they're in a, a position of authority. And I'm not saying that the national coach is wrong either. Like they're 100% entitled to their opinion. And I have an open mindset and... If they presented to me the, the stats and, and, and the facts and the figures, then I'm more likely to listen. But just telling me it doesn't look good isn't enough for me to justify making those changes. And I think this really highlights the pitfalls of a one-size-fits-all technique-focused philosophy. You can't compare players to each other. You can't compare players to a competency checklist. You can't look at, I don't know, a Murray or a Radicanu at the age of 10 and then compare this player to them. And I really hope that the player goes off with a new coach, a new coach who I respect and I like. And I, and, and I know for the fact that the new coach has been told to fix the serve in the back end. And of course, they're going to go off and try and fix the serve in the back end because they want to please the parents. But the whole experience is really just highlighted to me how stuck in tradition tennis coaching is. How we believe that if we have perfect technique, we're going to have great players or technique that looks really good and effective. And we look at biomechanics and if things don't look like we expect them to look, then we need to change it. Again, I'll use Medford, Evan, Tiafo. They would never go through our system here. They'll get changed. That's always been a slight or a criticism of British tennis, we have very technically great looking players. But when it comes to the match court, they don't perform. They look good. They've got really good technique. And I had a podcast a long time ago. It might have been Control the Controllables, Spanish coaches on. They were saying the Brits, like you speak to a Brit, tactically, they're so clever. 
but they can't put it on a tennis court under pressure. And he said, the Spanish players, they don't, they won't have all the answers if you ask them. But when you put them into a match situation, they'll just find solutions by a play. So that's the situation I'm in. I've lost a player, unfortunately. Sad to lose players. I'm always happy for players to move on. That's my job. My job is to get a player as far down the journey as possible and then they move on. And I'm hoping that the player goes on and they almost have the new manager effect where the coach is a fresh voice and a different pair of eyes and they can inspire the player to a higher level. And I really hope that for the player and the coach. The bit that's getting me is the process, the pathway. Why this has happened, it's because the player is following a linear journey from the national governing body. And because that linear journey has been stopped, that they now have hit the panic button and they're looking to try and find a, an alternative route in, which is sad. But there we go. I'll be interested to hear your thoughts and comments on this. I'm guessing this has happened to quite a few coaches. Listen, it's not the first time it's happened to me, and it definitely won't be the last time. And it goes back to the podcast I did a few months back about player pathways. I really struggle now to see a benefit in a player pathway, especially under 12. Is it right that we're judging players so early? Is it right that we're using things like technique to judge competency? Is it right that we're telling an 11-year-old that they're not good enough and they can't attend regional training? I hope you enjoyed that. Until next time, I'll speak to you soon. Thank you for tuning in to the My Tennis Coaching Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an update. Your support helps us bring more insightful discussions and valuable tips to enhancing your coaching journey. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at My Tennis Coaching for daily inspiration, coaching advice and behind the scenes content. Stay connected, stay inspired and keep pushing the boundaries of your coaching skills. Until next time, keep fostering growth, innovation and excellence on and off the court. See you in the next episode.